Uh, the, Ameri the program here today has its weaknesses, it has its virtues, it has its weaknesses, and there are still, you know, people standing up and reading boring papers. But the concept that that didn't have to be the only way in which a program is organized, that there were many ways of shaking up a gathering of historians, uh, that uh, all of, at, at the film, uh, the fact that we have films running all the time, the fact that we have poster session running all the time, that is Roy's baby. Uh, in 2003, he wrote a wonderful piece, which you can go look up, uh, for perspectives in which he said, he quoted J. Franklin Jameson and said, why do we still have boring meetings? And then there are these wonderful responses. Every single person on that response list said, you're right. Uh, absolutely, change it. And so, when we, as we reconceptualize what a gathering of historians means, it's Roy who, made, who, who boosted everybody uh, into making that happen. Uh, at the AHA, he was the energizer, insisting on open access to all our publications. That's why Perspectives is open. That's why the website for the AHA materials is open and free, uh, and uh, simultaneously he made us worry about how we would protect our digital record uh, and at the same time protect ourselves against information overload. So when I think of Roy's legacy, it is composed of a, a, a message to us not to be afraid to think big, to think largely about the great questions of the scholarly enterprise in which we are engaged. It's not only the microclimate of the work and writing that we do, it's about the questions of access to scholarship, the nature of what scholarship is, the audience for scholarship, the sources for scholarship, the nature of scholarly training, and the public action in which we must engage to advocate for the preservation of the past as a public responsibility. That is the Roy that Stephen just referred to as the Roy who was shaped in the 1960s and 1970s, who always demonstrated a faith in collective thinking and collective action. His books are themselves notably collaborative. Almost all of them have a co-conspirator. Betsy Blackmar, Susan Porter Benson, Leon Warren, Steve Breyer, uh, Dave Thielen, Jean-Christophe Agnew, uh, Daniel Cohn. And so in those ways also always posed a challenge, I am sure, to promotion and tenure committees about how we figure this one out. And his legacy is also a challenge to us to continue to pose those kinds of challenges. The other piece of his legacy, I think, is that he had, for all his destabilizing radicalism, he had an enormous faith in the institutional contexts in which we work or try to work. He did not ever give up on them. And so he transformed the learned societies in which he operated and into which he poured his heart and energy and his pocketbook. Uh, in the universities in which he operated and the Center for New Media seems to me to be uh, congruent with his faith that you don't walk away from the institutions that you inherited, but you transform them. And so I guess I end with, you know, feeling this challenge of and question of whether we can use that legacy well. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me introduce Gary Kornbluth very briefly in a different uh, context. As you know, Roy was not only a great historian, a great colleague, but he was uh, an incredible builder of institutions and organizations that will keep things going. And 
I found that in trying to uh, somewhat pay a reflection of that, it